Hi, I'm Tim Harrison. I'm the Managing Director of Ionic Rare Earths. We're developing primary and secondary magnet and heavy rare earth supply for the new economy. Cassie, Tim. Hi, Matt. We're doing this annually. We're here last <laughs> same yeah. spot. Yeah, but but it's um, slightly different this year in terms of you know there's the one to one conference, Anandaba. The attendee list see in terms of investors, pretty impressive this year. Yeah, we're starting to see a few new groups uh, attending. So. Um, you know, some of the EVOEMs, um, sovereign funds, yeah. um, and potentially, yeah, a bit more money coming out of Africa. It's, I mean, that, that doesn't sound like a big deal of people listening to this. You could kind of, you know, say that sentence and let, let it go. But com- compared to last year, when the, the money wasn't here, no one was interested in coming to these conferences. At OEMs, they don't need to come to these things. So you kind of feel that, right? But that, they could pick up the phone and say, Oi, Tim, come over here, and you'd, you'd come running. Now... It's a slight sort of, not desperation, but a slight realization that it's getting tough to actually find projects which are real and will actually go through the phases and get into production. Yeah, they've got to be more proactive, yeah. I think. Um, there's a there's a, a fundamental issue here, supply v. demand. Yeah. Um, and without that supply being available and the demand forecasted to, to you know, shoot through the, the ceiling, yeah. um, they've got to be more proactive in finding those projects, those groups, who they think can actually bring new production to, to the market. Right. And that's in the context, right? You, you say that, right? And then we look at what the rare earth prices are doing. Yep. Back down on the floor again compared yep. to where they were. It's very erratic. It's very hard to read. As an investor, I'm like going, what the heck is going on here? I'm being told the demand is awesome. The future is bright. And then the prices do this. What's happening? Well, <laughs> that's a great question, Matt, because usually this time of year, you would expect rare earth prices to be increasing ahead of uh, restocking for you know Chinese New Year. It's not happening. So, well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, you, you don't know. know potentially, so... there's manipulation. I don't know. Okay, um, but you nervous? That, not really, because the fundamentals you be, are still though? strong. Shouldn't you be? Because you got to work out. You know, you need, you need to work out the math here. Is this project going to be economic? Is is there a future for it? Yeah. No, I think we're we're quite comfortable the pricing for. For certainly our basket of magnet and heavy rare earths will be significantly higher than where it is today. I mean, the reality is the world is going to need more supply of, in the first instance, magnet rare earths right. for the energy transition, whether that be electric vehicles or offshore wind. Right. But then you've got these other geopolitical tensions which are looking for alternative supply chains of magnet rare earths, heavy rare earths, for key applications, advanced manufacturing, military and defence, and then the other opportunity for ourselves is the circular economy, the recycling, which is uh, going well. Yeah, and we'll we'll come on to the you, know, you kind of got like three silos. We're well, not silos; they're all they're interconnected. But yep. um, three different kind of revenue streams. That, but, but, I want, but I do want to come back to this: what the future holds. Okay, what's going to be the driver of this? Who, who you, you talk about the circular economy? That outside of China, China represents. 94% of production, you know, 70% of, of mines. It's like in every category to do with rare earths, China's the go-to place. It's, yep. It seems impossible to do rare earths, you know, outside of China. What are you going to do about it? Well, I think we, we can help to bring that to, to fruition through recycling as a first step, you know. Okay. I, I like to think of it as priming the pump on the supply chain. So through recycling... Okay. We can start to put hands in the supply chain, metal makers, alloy makers, magnet makers, and, and start to generate those relationships. Okay, so let's step back a bit because for people new to this, it's, it's important to understand what you've got. Yep. You've got Makutu, which is a, a, you know an ore body of quite significant size. which it's pretty you, big. Pretty big, yeah. Um, then you've kind of got a pro- processing complaint where you've, you, you've got to create a kind of concentrate, extract that basket of, of rare earths, and then you've got the recycling bit yep. up in Belfast. Um, but you're saying the smallest component of opportunity in front of you, the recycling, is the starting point. So I, I, explain explain the strategy, the logic there. Yeah, so what we're seeing is a lot of inbound inquiry right. um, because it is a solution that we can offer to all Western governments. Right. Anybody who wants advanced manufacturing now, we can literally take our tech yeah. which we're, we're operating a, a demonstration plant now and a, and a feasibility study later this year. Yeah. 
um, we can take that we're, replica in, in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Belfast, in right, the UK, okay, yeah, right. Northern Ireland. Okay, so great location, dual market access across both the UK and EU, right? So we get to play, in, yeah, yeah, in both uh, both markets, yeah, yeah, quite fortuitous. Um, but we can replicate that, we can franchise that. You know, we can offer that as a solution to you know a number of parties we're talking with now. Um, to be able to provide a solution in other markets that are looking for magnet rare earths, separated magnet rare earth oxides that can be redeployed in the production of new magnets and new applications potentially in military and defence. Right, but come back to that scale thing, right? I want to buy into a big, big vision, and, and you're going to need to be scale yep. outside of China to be one, be noticed, and two, obviously, you know, attract the sorts of money that she, which you may want for the for the um, Makutu asset, it, I get the, you know, was it, it would be, I don't know what you call it, I was going to say software as a service, but it's it, it, the, the technology solution for people there. But it's such a small component. It's re recycling of batteries. Is there much of that happening in Europe and why is it in demand? Well, at the moment, I think uh, some of the numbers suggest there's only about 1% to maybe 3% tops wow. of magnets in the EU being recycled in the EU. A lot of material finds its way back into the existing supply chain through Southeast Asia and into China. Right. Where recycling now makes up about 40% of the magnet rare earth supply chain. Right. So there is policy that's starting to be implemented where the export of this material outside of jurisdiction is, is illegal because this is such a, a critical raw material. Yeah. And so we can now replicate our technology yeah. in those countries, in those markets to start working on sovereign capability, domestic capability, um, to support local manufacturing. Okay. And remind me some of, remind me some of the, uh, I'm not sure if it's regulated yet or, or, or the kind of conditions precedent on some of these OEMs in terms of recycled materials, yep. et cetera. I mean, how's the EU helping incentivize? Great question, Matt. Yeah. So that's the EU Critical Raw Material Act where they've yeah. mandated. They've set the target 25% of strategic raw materials, of which magnet um, rare earths are, are a part of, 25% of that market has to come from recycling by the end of this decade. Okay, that's that's a lot. It's too big to ignore. Where we are today. Yeah. So, you know, will they get there? Can they get there? And how does that benefit you? Oh, I think they can. I think they've got the infrastructure and the attitude towards recycling already in place. Right. Um, we've certainly had a lot of good dialogue with stakeholders in the supply chain there, um, governments, OEMs and the like right. who um, have a, a greater acceptance of, of recycling as part of their supply chain yeah. relative to, I suppose, immediate exposure to, to primary mining assets. Okay. So talk me through the process because the, the lead times for OEMs, they don't move quickly. No. Okay. Um, and given you're using the recycling as the kind of spearhead uh, of the strategy um, into Europe. Um, what is the process? You talk about piloting at the moment. Who with? How long does that take? Contracts, uh, you know, they're not going to start big. They're going to start, they're going to test you, right? Yes, so, that's exactly right. How does that work? And, you know, what, show me the money, Tim. Show me the money. So what's what's happening now is we build a demonstration plant and we're going to 24-7 in Belfast. Mm -hmm. We want to run that for as long as we can, but, but data from that feeding into a feasibility study, which we're aiming to have completed this year, We've already announced a collaboration partnership with Less Common Metals, which is the only uh, metal, um, rare earth metal and alloy manufacturer in, in, in the European area, um, and Ford on developing a UK domestic rare earth supply chain uh, for magnet rare earths. Mm -hmm. And with that demonstration plant running, we're also now scheduling in other programs of work from other groups, okay. as you said, testing us, yep. understanding what we can do for them put that through our demonstration plant as well to be able to start to move forward with some of these other potential relationships. Okay, okay. So Ford? Yes. How, have they, how much money have they thrown at you or at this? Oh, look, I mean, we're, process. the government is actually sponsoring this this program. Right, okay. Um, so, so it's their money first, okay. Yep. And then, um, because I think where it kind of moves for companies like yourself is when, say, a Ford or any other OEM or any other kind of big battery manufacturer in, in Europe, well, there aren't many, um, you know, they step up, they endorse you in a way, yes. either financially or in some kind of contract. So you're going through a process to try and 
deliver that completely. Yeah. How long does it take? Good question. I, I think with rare earth prices where they are right now, yeah. maybe the incentive from the market, yeah. from the OEM, isn't as great as yeah. if the price was three times as much. Right. So right now... Meaning what? They can go and buy from China... That, that's it. It's not the buy. burning ledge. Right. Okay. Right? That, that maybe other things are. But then that comes back to, in terms of how you, as a CEO of the company, you know, deliver a strategy to take advantage of a market like this. Can you take it more, or are you out of control and sitting back waking, waiting for the price to peak again? Because it, it's so erratic. I kind of want it to stabilize yep. so people know, and you want to know where, where everything sits, where the margins are, how you make money, money. Yeah. how you plan, and how you, how you raise capital to come build out some kitty, for yeah. instance, right? So ourselves, like others in the supply chain right now, whether that be metal alloy, magnet manufacturers and the OEM, know that just because the price is where it is today doesn't mean it's going to be there tomorrow okay. or next year or the year after. They will see higher prices. Why? Because the thematic is not going away. The supply v demand, right, infers that there is simply not the supply coming to market that's required in order to meet the demand on the electrification of um, transport, um, energy transition, um, you know, and, and new things like... Um, air conditioners and, and robotics, like these are significant demands that are being fundamentally overlooked. Okay. There has been a kind of so, slight um, slowdown or, or enthusiasm from the car manufacturers about a total 100% EV solution. I think some people are rowing back, not just targets, but perhaps the intent to have in their entire f um, fleet or portfolio of, of cars, trucks, etc as EV because they're worried about being, being able to access the amount of metals that they um, are going to need. So, I mean, do you, do you worried about that? No, because, I mean, the fundamental, again, is not changing. Like, if it's not going to be used in the EV, it's going to be used in the air conditioner. It's going to be used in the offshore wind. There's a fundamental thematic happening here, mm. right? Okay, they're going to push back targets on electric vehicles. But I can guarantee you that the production coming out of China will not slow down. But if it doesn't slow down, is that, why is that good for you? Um, well, because the, the Chinese are going to consume all of the magnet rare earths that they can produce, they can get their hands on, yeah. which means that there's very, very little available for other key industries and applications that continue to require magnet rare earths. So, you know, in my opinion, China has got no interest in selling one kilo of separated rare earths. It wants to sell you a BYD. It wants the full economic rent. Now, what does that mean for advanced manufacturing in the West? What, what does it mean? Well, there's not going to be much of it if they haven't got access to the material. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a fundamental industrial problem that needs to be solved with the support of government. Um, and that's why we've seen, again, a lot of, I think... Um, sovereign funds here looking to... Well, yeah. I mean, I'll, we'll better name one of them because they're, they're very active. They're, they're, in, they're in conference recently, so it's the Saudis. They are getting a little bit interested in this kind of metal super cycle that, yep. they're, that they're saying. They've definitely got the balance sheet to kind of come and be a meaningful partner to lots of people. So how do you, as a junior, can I... Say you're talking to... I'm going to use them, right? But I know there's a whole bunch of others uh, in terms of sovereign wealth funds. Yeah. Um, how do you say to them, look, if you've got the, if you understand this and you've got the intent and the balance sheet, we can put all of this together. Because, like I say, going for, and I get the kind of strategic importance of going with the recycling bit first, because it establishes relationships, trusted partner, all of that yep. kind of good stuff. And, you know, you've got some of that. Well, maybe we can do something else for you. And I get all of that. And that's being agile and nimble in the market to one that survive the ups and downs of what has been a difficult junior uh, well, equities market. But if you if you can say to a big partner, look, there's my key to it's massive. Yeah. It's got a big capex, but the long term low capex. I sorry, sorry, so it's it's got a low low capex. Yeah, sorry. I said hi, didn't I? Um it's got a low, low capex, but it's it um is something that if prices stabilized could be a very good um, you know, supply, that's ex-China. We've got the technology, yep. um, and we've got the recycling, which is kind of giving us open a few doors, et cetera. If, is, that, is that what you want to do? 
Gene, you need a strategic, it feels like, in a market like this, to kind of, you know, um, stabilize those those curves. That, that's right. And, and, and I think because of the complexity associated with a rare yeah. earth market, those strategics have been working on this for some time. Yeah. Um, but they're not going to fire one shot. They're going to fire multiple shots in a coordinated effort that addresses not only primary supply from a mine, but requires refining capacity, metal capacity, um, alloy and magnet capacity to feed into advanced manufacturing. And trying to get all of these things lined up at the same time when, you know, a bit of capacity exists here, there's a deposit here and magnet maker over here, trying to get everybody to come together yeah. requires a lot of coordination. And I think from what we see, where we see this happening, I don't think this is far off because there has been a lot of work by some of those, you know, sovereign funds and, and strategic um, right. initiatives from government to say, this is what we want. And they've empowered groups to go out there and start to put the, the architecture together. Right. And, and I feel very comfortable that Makuta will be part of that. But do you, do you feel that um, it's all moved quite slowly? And it's big, I know because the, the economic backdrop and I, why, but at the end of the day, if you want to be ex-China, you want to talk the, the game of critical minerals and critical security around minerals, the governments are going to have to kind of step up and make it easier. You, you, you're, you're saying to me that the EU is doing, some, you know, some incentivization in there. Could they be doing more? Do you want more from them? Can you get more from them? You know, and how do strategics, how do you help strategics insert themselves into that conversation? And, yeah, I, I, I think uh, there can be a lot more done. Um, you know, you've got the EU and the US um, both here in, in reasonable sort okay. of... Uh, presence, yeah, um, and and so both of them are working now um, on their own plans, but collectively together on the mineral security partnership, along with a number of other countries. Um, so there is some coordination coming into the space, okay. um, but maybe a little bit more on that at a at a later point in time. Okay, okay, well, good, good man. It's like, I, like I appreciate appreciate you coming in and talking to us because it's kind of it's kind of that sort of um, twilight zone at the moment where you kind of like trying to work out what the moving parts are. I, say, I think you've answered the question with regards to you know there is a kind of um, big demand cycle coming yep. down the line. And it's not about today's prices. It's about setting yourself up for success. You know, in the near future. Yeah, and that's when I want to see more from you guys, and sort of, you know, we'd love to love to hear from you. Well, it's about security supply. It's about being able to have those relationships. You know, we are, for some countries and groups, uh, with the recycling, a fantastic insurance policy that can be deployed very quickly, and then Makutu is a you know a long life asset that that can give them uh, a significant amount of independence, but it needs more ionic absorption clay deposits to be brought to market. Okay. Well, patience required. Stay in touch. Thanks, Matt. Cheers, man. See ya. I appreciate it.